No, it's okay. Uh, whatever you can do. Uh, Hey, uh, good morning. Maybe we can get us started. Uh, today, we are very honored to have uh, Professor uh, Jin Gang Yi from Rutgers University, all the way from New Jersey to North Carolina, and give us a talk about uh, uh, learning based uh, uh, control and uh, treated robotics. Professor Yi, I feel like uh, he's a, like, like my uh, academic career advisor, and I have known Professor Yi for quite a few years. He's a, uh, uh, like a, uh, he's a very well known in uh, control and dynamics, and uh, his researchers include uh, like uh, assistive robots, human robot interaction, uh, autonomous vehicle, this application in uh, transportation, robotics, and uh, civil infrastructure. Uh, he's also uh, like a, uh, I think a, a, a senior uh, senior editor in several uh, leading robotics and mechatronic journals, and uh, we are very honored to have him here today uh, to visit us and give uh, the talk about uh, model based control and the learning based control. Uh, really, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thank, you. Thank, right. you. thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So um, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to a house uh, introduction. And uh, so I'm from Rutgers, uh, the State University of New Jersey, which is uh, very similar to NC State here. So um, let me just uh, probably I will spend uh, probably first uh, 15 minutes or so to give you an overview of my research. And uh, I was uh, trained as an uh, applied control engineer. And uh, over years, my research areas really spread out into the different uh, domain of the mechanical primarily mechanical systems, uh, such as uh, uh, robotic uh, autonomous robots and uh, vehicle systems, and also uh, recently uh, in a physical human robot interactions. So uh, my current focus areas are primarily in these uh, three main research areas. One is uh, autonomous robots, uh, the vehicle systems, and uh, physical human robot interactions, and uh, also in the automation uh, with the uh, different uh, application areas like uh, you know uh, civil infrastructures and uh, manufacturing and um, you know micro nano systems. So uh, one of my um, areas I early days uh, and also even nowadays we're studying how the you know race car drivers uh, behavior. How do we drive the car like a race car driver? And uh, on the right hand side here I had the video uh, basically demonstrated uh, what we're interested in here. It's uh, how we learn the racing uh, driving strategies, primarily how do we sacrifice the stability but uh, still keep the safety. At the same time, we're trying to do uh, to achieving high, um, high agility. So this is a sort of the projects of my early days of when I started my career, and this is a sort of a pro one of the projects there. So later on, I expanded into more like a motion planning and uh, how do we learn human really taking care of uh, the ground conditions in the right side. You see the video here. This is built by the steel car. This car actually can run like uh, 60, I think 40 to 60 mile per hour. And uh, fully we're trying to take the indoor uh, experiments. Uh, what we did here is trying to on purpose sliding on the ground to achieve the high agility when you do the turning, high speed turning. So uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a one of the um, 
you know, sort of ongoing projects that we have been, you know, studying this kind of behavior, how do we learn with uh, this kind of uh, uh, untypical driving skills. So um, let me just stop here. Uh, other type of the, uh, research we're doing is uh, sort of using the embedded uh, smart sensors into the tire, which is related to autonomous driving. If we know what is the ground conditions, uh, so on the left-hand side here, we build um, sort of a smart tire uh, technologies. We put the sort of uh, different type of sensors, those are flexible, flexible sensors. So really, we're trying to sense this uh, tire road interaction in real time and uh, passing that information to the autonomous driving uh, onboard controller. On the right-hand side here, this is a more regional project. This is a more uh, FAA um, sort of, uh, we build this uh, testing bed for FAA. They're interested, uh, they're interested in how the air, airport runway, when they have the uh, groups on the, on, the, on, the, on the track, how they're gonna impact on the aircraft landing and the braking performance, uh, particularly during the raining days or slowing days, so that's the joint project. Uh, we just built this uh, during the pandemic. These are actually built by undergraduate students at Rutgers. And uh, they really, uh, we have been delayed this uh, since because of the pandemic, but uh, recently uh, we just uh, set it up this and uh, you know, basically we have embedded sensors inside. This is act actually this uh, a small aircraft tire. So that's uh, sort of uh, uh, ongoing activities uh, in more like uh, smart sensors and the flexible sensors. Uh, integrated with, uh, with, um, with autonomous systems. Some other projects we studied the human robot interaction. In this example, uh, we studied the, how human ride a bicycle, how our whole body motor skills interact with an unstable platform. So we modify a bicycle system, and as you can see here, this is a, actually it's an autonomous bicycle system, and in the middle here, we, uh, we modify the steering paddling actuations, uh, as well as we put this uh, gyroscopic balancing, we call the gyro, gyro balancer, which is create additional torque, either balanced or disturb the human. So the basic idea here is to break down human sensory motor uh, mechanism. So we perturb the human and we, we try to figure out what is the human reaction to that perturbation so that we can understand how the human use their body movements or the speed control or the steering trying to uh, balance this uh, move, moving unstable platform. So that's a, that's a, you know, we did this a couple of years ago and still, you know, we're, we have the current projects, we're trying to um, study sort of like a human in the loop system uh, in that regard. So uh, some others related to human biomechanics. This is a sort of, a, we're trying to study, uh, we're trying to study uh, how the humans, uh, the locomotion, the bipedal locomotion, so under the foot sleep, how the humans reacting to that and how this uh, sleep will induce the fall and how we're gonna use the wearable um, exoskeleton. I think uh, Dr. Hao Su provided us the knee exoskeleton. So we're trying to understand how this knee exoskeleton will react, right? If you provide, the challenge in here is the sleep happen very quick. And then typical human neural system react to that sleep, detects sleep probably around two to 400 milliseconds. So in order for this exoskeleton to help or you know, provide adjustive torque or even just trigger the human the neural motor skills, then you do need this uh, detection fast enough and then provide adjustive torque or either adjustive torque or maybe just uh, trigger the human's uh, muscle skeleton systems to uh, recover from the sleep. So we did these uh, exoskeletons and we did some studies uh, by instruments, the, the, the human, the, the shoe, the, this, uh, install the pressure sensor map and also look at what is the propagation of this sleep happens. And then with this, with the wearable sensors, we'll detect the sleep. And then with the actual skeletons, we're trying to, um, we're trying to provide the assistive uh, torque to mitigate this risk to fall. Related to that, this is a more recent study. We're trying to use the wearable sensors, machine learning techniques, and also uh, the, the, the actual skeleton variable assistive device for construction workers. And uh, by working with, um, with the labor economists and also the social and the economics uh, researchers in the Rutgers, we have these projects just the last couple of years. Uh, we're trying to understand how we're going to develop and this uh, all sort of emerging techniques, right, to help the construction workers to keep this um, workforce development 
and also study how do we train the workforce by using uh, VR or mixed realities, uh, those kind of new techniques, new technologies. A um, couple of years ago, uh, this is probably 10 years ago, I worked with uh, you know, uh, civil engineers, uh, infrastructure, we developed this infrastructure robotic systems. On the left-hand side, this is our non-destructive um, robotic systems, um, which is um, already being implemented um, at the multiple uh, states. And uh, so in the left-hand side, we have this robotic system to do the you know, um, uh, bridge deck uh, inspection. Basically, if there's uh, cracks inside the bridge deck, it's not, you're not gonna see this uh, from the surface of the, of the deck surface, but if there are cracks or denaminations there, how we're gonna detect those using this uh, you know, integrated robotic system to efficiently to detect those or identify the problem. And on the right-hand side, we develop, uh, we develop uh, this uh, robotic um, sort of a minimally uh, invasive uh, technique to redo the rehabilitation. So the idea there, is uh, trying to have those, uh, um, once we have the inspection robots and we know where's the problem, we send the second robot system there. We drill the hole on the bridge deck, we inject those uh, uh, epoxies, uh, the concrete epoxies, try to fill in those cracks and denominations. And that's, uh, that's a sort of all this process should be done you know, autonomously. And that's a teamwork between these two robotic systems to finish this uh, sort of infrastructure uh, maintenance and, um, and um, repairment. So uh, related to that, on, the, on this project here, on the left hand side, you see those uh, um, parking lot, you have these cracks and everywhere, the, actually this uh, picture is taken at um, FAA, uh, uh, the research center in Atlantic City. So you see this crack here, and the idea that we're in this project here is uh, how you drill to this robotic system to do the crack detection and the thinning. So I, the, the challenge here, on the right-hand side, you see this picture. This is what, what we create, the indoor testing bed. We have this robotic system here. So basically, the idea is uh, how you're going, if you don't know where's the crack, how do you build a robotic system and the algorithm to detect the cracks, and also, simultaneously, you want to fill the crack. So one of the idea, one of the algorithms we came up is um, how do we do this uh, um, sort of uh, detection, mapping, and uh, repairment at the same time. So uh, this video is a little bit long, so let me just uh, say, just tell you, uh, if you have the cracks, you don't know where they are, and you send this robot, and it's just like a rumble, you know, like, a, like, a, like you do the vacuum, vacuum robot. But the challenge in here is you're not just a detect where the crack, but also there, you want to fill those cracks at the same time. So uh, if you see, the, you see the, the watermark here, those are cracks, you send in this robot there, the robot has a sensor <coughs> range. Same time, the robot, to fill those cracks, there's the physical constraint there to, to reach to those cracks. So you, you know where they are, and then you just, uh, your sensor range and your robot, uh, um, the footprint, are different sides. So how you're getting this algorithm to really um, detect them the most efficiently, minimum time or travel distance. And we came up with this algorithm and trying to identify them. And uh, there's a sort of complex, you know, uh, motion planning and, uh, and the filling um, sort of uh, algorithm there. And uh, I think later on, we have those um, different type of the algorithm. You see that there's a comparison between the different algorithms. Here are the cracks. You see those cracks. That these are more like the simulated uh, sort of uh, not actual cracks, but we're just trying to do the control environments. You have a different type of the motion planning algorithm. The, the, the naive one is just like a do the zigzag, right? I don't know where they are. I don't care. I just use these robots to do the zigzag, and the dark turn out to be it's not an efficient one, right? You can think about it. It's a, it's a, depends on what is the distribution of these cracks. You could come up with a more efficient algorithm, and uh, we have the bunch of algorithms we're just uh, just to show to you. Um, the more, you know, what you, which ones give you the best uh, minimum time to, to achieve this kind of uh, problem. Here are just some videos to demonstrate that, uh, you know, this is more like a printer, right? So the robot is just like a printer. You drop those paint on the cracks, you detect it, and then uh, you have a larger sensor range to, to detect where they are. Then you move this robot, and then these two problems, the, the detecting part with the coverage part are coupled problems. So there's a sort of two 
uh, planning problem coupled together, that makes this problem is uh, more challenging and more uh, more interesting actually. So um, that's that's the one uh, we did this, and um, so similarly, I work with uh, my Rutgers as a very good um, ocean uh, coastal scientist. Uh, you know, we built uh, we had one project using these um, underwater autonomous gliders. And uh, what we did there, we're trying to build an uh, algorithm for them for the underwater localization, and also we built a bio sampler for them. On the right hand side, we have these uh, projects working with um, ECE department uh, on the heterogeneous uh, robotic system, including the navigators here, which is uh, like a quadrilateral. You can dive into the water, you can fly in the air. In the middle layer here, you have this underwater. A robotic system, and on the upper level, level three, you do have these uh, um, surface uh, vessels, and you do have this multiple different type of the robotic system to coordinate, do the water quality monitoring, and that was uh, the project a couple of years ago. Uh, also, recently, we're working with the agriculture plant biologists, and what's really interesting here, this is actually two projects. The first project we did here using this motorcycle sort of uh, a robotic manipulator, so we're doing the stress uh, detection for the plants. And that was a uh, founded uh, work with the uh, Siemens uh, Research Corporation uh, in Princeton, New Jersey. And, uh, and, and later on, we work on, uh, we continue these projects uh, doing this uh, ground aero vehicle uh, robotic detecting system for turf grass uh, water ma irrigation management by using the machine learning. So we build this uh, lightweight uh, robotic system here. We're trying to uh, do the ground inspection for the turf grass, and so detect those grass situations and uh, for the irrigation management. And recently, we just, uh, we just uh, this summer, we did a test in there. You see this, uh, this is on campus, we do have this farm, this is our robots, this is the aerial view of this uh, ground robotic system. So this is just the first prototype. Uh, prototype we built, and uh, the, the, it's just started. This is uh, uh, sponsored by the USDA, and um, it's take a, quite a bit of effort uh, to, to run these robots uh, in the field. So we're, this is a sort of ongoing effort. We we're, we're work with uh, Siemens uh, using the uh, machine learning techniques to uh, manage this uh, irrigation system. So uh, some other work I mentioned about, this is a joint work a couple of years ago, and actually it's uh, probably eight years ago. Uh, this is another founded project. The idea here is using the nanowires, how we're going to manipulate the nanowires, control the nanowires to build the functional device. So we, we have this uh, microfluidic device. So the interesting of this problem is, if you look at this schematic here, you do have a different type of nanowires. Those wires are just like 20 microns in length and the diameter is uh, you know, probably 20 to 50 nanometers. So in order to build the functional device, it's very difficult to move those wires and also to position them. All right, that's, that's a challenging here. This is figure out a very interesting control problem here. Basically, you do have this microfluidic device, you do have the wires suspended in the fluid environment, you do have this, uh, on the bottom of this, you do have these electrodes. You're turning on a combination of the different electrodes, you change the electrode field, then those wires are gonna, going to move together, you know, along the, wire, along the electrode field, you change. So the turn out to be an interesting problem is how you're gonna control those multiple nano wires simultaneously by the same group of electrodes. You have common inputs there, but how you're gonna address each individual, individual wire. So, so this is our most like a motion planning control problem, very interesting control problem there. So uh, my student, Tai Yan, she worked out this uh, algorithm. We can control those wires. You see this uh, initial position, the three wires, we can form the different shape simultaneously. We can drive those wires under different motions simultaneously. And uh, this is a, you know, I had a, a, if you have that kind of a function, you could uh, build this uh, fib microfabrication uh, process such that you could uh, characterize using the motion of the wires to figure out what is their properties, right? That's the, that's the so if the wire rotation faster, that means maybe it's more conductive or it's a semiconductors or it's isolators. And then by different properties, you can separate them you can deposit in a, on a different uh, um, uh, device here. Here we build um, nanowired uh, transistors and it turned out to be a nice uh, properties by using this technique. 
to address these uh, properties and integrate them with uh, fiber caching. And actually, I, I didn't uh, pursue this direction in the recent years. Uh, my student, former student, Kai Yan, she started uh, assistant professor somewhere, and the, her career proposal award built on this, uh, this, uh, this technique, and primarily she's working on uh, this problem. All right, so I, I spend about 20 minutes here and uh, talk about, uh, I did, hopefully, I give you a, a sample of uh, a different projects we're working on. For the rest of the half an hour, 35 minutes, uh, I will just uh, focus on one topic, I'll dive in, and just to show you one of the you know, recent development we have done by using the learning-based control of the under-actuated robotic system. Now, what is uh, under-actuated? Well, we're mechanical engineers, so we know that uh, under-actuated means uh, the number of the control input is less than number of the degree freedom, right? You have more degree freedom, but you have a less control, authority, right? Now, uh, what is the balance here? Well, balance means uh, we have some um, unstable system and you try to make it uh, stable or you, you try to maintain a balance of the mechanical system intuitively, right? What are those systems? Well, one example is uh, this uh, rotary inverted pendulum. The goal for us here is, uh, you know, that this is our two joints um, robotic system. You have the one joint here, the base joint here, the base link here, which is controlled by the motor here. Now, the, the pendulum here, these are passive joints. So the theta, uh, the theta is active joints, alpha is uh, under unactuated. So the goal for us to control this device is we're giving you the desired trajectory for theta. We ask you to track in the desired trajectory of theta. Same time, we want you to balance in this unstable system. In other words, I want the, the arm, the passive arm to swing up on the top, and then I want the base arm to follow certain trajectory, right? So you might say, okay, um, the upper name where we are trying to balance there, maybe it's close to zero degrees, more up there, but indeed it depends on what is the theta you're going to swing. You, we, we do know that maybe the arm shouldn't be really at the vertical upright position, right? Another example, the bicycle system. Well, the bicycle system, you can control the speed, you can control the steering, right? You have two control inputs, and you have three degree freedom. You have the X, Y position, and also the row angle, you try to stabilize it. So you do have the stabilized task. Now, we all know that when you ride a bicycle, when you turn at a circular trajectory, you need to tell your body at a certain degree, that's the most uh, optimal position you have. Actually, that's just what is the seat alpha angle it should be satisfied. So basically, what we are doing here, if you're tracking a certain trajectory, you have the XY position you are follow. Same time, you want the row angle being maintained at a certain angle. It's not necessarily zero. The, 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 the angle here, the row angle is, uh, I define as a, as, a, as a precise here. And what I mean here is um, you do want the angle tilted. Now, the tilted angle based on how fast you're running, whether you're turning or straight line, right? It depends on your tracking trajectory, but it's not a given. You need to figure out, as the controller, to figure out what is the row angle I should maintain. Third example, uh, human walking, bipedal walking, right? So you do have this, uh, if you look at this picture here, we model the human walking as, uh, you know, five link, or maybe if you counted the, the, the foot, uh, maybe the seven link, or whatever link you're gonna have here. You have, in this example here, you have uh, probably six joints, uh, six actuations, you have hip, two joints, um, knee, and ankle. Six, six actuations you have, both sides, right, bilateral. And you have seven you know, degree of freedom here because your upper, the torso you have, right, is, a, is back and forth. So that's the reason as a baby you start learning how to walk. It's not an easy task. We took it for granted. We say, okay, you know, this is easy. You know, human, everybody can do it. But indeed, it turned out to be a control problem. It's not that uh, straightforward, right? It's under actuated, and we want to follow a certain gate. The gate actually is what is the sort of desired trajectory similarly analog to the, to the bicycle example or your inverted pendulum example, right? So, so for all this system I just described here, right? They are under-actuated. They are, you know, basically have the, more or less has this uh, balancing issue there, right? 
um, for pendulum system, bicycles, human walking. So they represent a class of the underactuated mechanical system. And uh, the, it turned out to be to control this kind of system, you do to, to design the control, nonlinear controller there, you do need, uh, you know, in order to predict what you're in the future, you do need this, uh, you know, if I knew what I'm going to do in the future, then I can design with my current controller to maintain this uh, non-minimum phase uh, control problem here. That's, you know, in your, in your undergraduate or graduate nonlinear control class, you will learn this, right? You need, uh, you know, getting this, uh, uh, the, the inverted, basically. You need the inverting uh, non-minimum phase system. We all know that inverting non-minimum phase system turned out to be a challenging problem. So um, our goal here is today, I'm just the uh, first, I'm gonna review and give you, if I knew the model, how I'm gonna do that job, right? Uh, then I'm gonna talk about, if I don't know the physical model, can I build on the data-driven learning-based controller to achieve the same kind of performance, but moreover, we don't want a, a black box model, right? We don't want to just, uh, you know, I do the deep neural network learning and uh, figure out this works, then I want some guarantee. And uh, so that's, uh, that's how my talk, uh, I was, you know, sort of separate these two parts and presented what is, uh, you know, if I knew the model, what I'm gonna do with it, then I'm going to pro provide a sort of like a more transparent uh, learning-based controller, which is uh, somehow can guarantee me this, uh, this, is, this could work and this is the performance I, I could, uh, I could uh, achieve. So let's look at the, if I knew the model, what is, what, how we're going to do the control design. Now, we all know this mechanical system. We do have this uh, using, um, you know, Lagrangian mechanics or you can come up with a dynamics model for the robots. And here, uh, the input dimension is m, and uh, the, the calling is uh, m plus m, right? Here, for the interest, of, we're assuming uh, m is greater than m. For the technical reasons, um, I'm going to explain a little bit more uh, if you have more questions on that. Now, then we're going to partition the calling into two parts. One is the actuated part, one is the unactuated part. Okay, so we, we, we can do this job, you know, this mathematically, you can partition, oh, this part, like I said, the example alpha and theta, you could uh, use uh, theta is more actuated joints, um, coordinates, and alpha is um, unactuated. And so you can put the system dynamics that's uh, sort of uh, uh, theta dynamics here and alpha dynamics here, you know, with the nonlinear function capture the, their dynamics, which is given by this equation here. Now, um, the system here that we, we talk about, the system is unstable. Basically, the alpha dynamics, if you don't control it well, it's, uh, it's unstable, right? So, um, so we do partition the system, stable and unstable. Now, here's a key part of this uh, whole idea. Um, if you partition these dynamics, you know, you see this uh, theta dynamics and alpha dynamics, and uh, indeed, we call it the external dynamics and internal dynamics. And if you see their, their, their structure actually are quite uh, symmetric, right? So uh, if you learn the control system, what you can do, there's a two type of way you can deal with that. Well, you can say, first of all, I'm gonna design the controller Z such that I'm going to first stabilize or tracking this theta first, and then I'm going to have this kind of, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, input the transform the system, which is given by theta dynamics, and uh, here's my control is Z, then I'm going to invert it at theta, and then I'm going to plug in the upper dynamics. Fine, I mean, this is quite uh, straightforward. Now, the other way is, okay, I'm not going to take in the theta first, I'm going to take in the alpha first, I'm going to design my control V here, so that my dynamics becomes this. Well, they're, they're symmetric. Typologically, they're equivalent. Right, so so they're symmetric and also they're dual. You know, meaning uh, one could be converted to the other if you do some uh, input transformation. Now that's turned out to be very critical in my talk today. Um, basically, if you if I see this uh, statement here, if you do the input uh, sort of transformations, you will say this uh, external and the internal system here are basically they're just symmetric. They're dual. You don't you don't need to. Well, you can consider this is the internal and or the, or, the inter, uh, or the external. This is what said, this is the external internal convertible form, meaning they're just a symmetric. Either way to do will end up with a similar type of the 
the, the, the structure. However, in terms of the controller design, that could be some different, which is we fully take advantage of that kind of uh, property. All right, uh, let's go with the first, and let's go with the top one, the blue color one here. Let's say, if I'm going to go this way, because my goal here is I'm going to design a controller to make sure theta is attracting theta D at the same time, alpha is balanced, right? So let me give you an example how we're turning the bicycle dynamics into that. Here's the bicycle. This is the position of the, of the bicycle system. And if you take the third derivative of that, you're getting this uh, sort of a kinematics relationship. And then you have the row dynamics here. So you have the external system, which is the capture the position of the bicycle. And the internal system here capture the row angle of the bicycle. Well, you don't need to worry about this, you know, this uh, mathematical formulation here. So I just want to, you to understand what is the basic idea here. If you have external system concerns more about the position of the bicycle, and this internal system here concerns about the row angle, the balancing part. Right, so that's what we uh, the, the system the equations represent. Now, the basic idea here is quite uh, I said quite intuitive. Taking the bicycle as an example, right? So the basic idea here is well, depends on what the trajectory you are following, depends on how fast you're you're tracking. I need to calculate we call the balancing equilibrium manifold. Meaning, what is the desired row angle if I ride a bicycle? If I turn in this this trajectory, if I know how fast I'm turning. So I need to tilt it at a certain angle. Give an example of the bicycle, right? We all know that if you're, like I said, you know, if you're turning the bicycle at a fast speed, at a very sharp turn, you need the row angle be large to keep the balance. It's not a vertical position. We all know that if you start turning, you better to turn your row angle of the body so, so that it's row that's the most natural way to go. And actually, that's mathematically, we capture this by through called the balance equilibrium manifolds. So you need to calculate that, right? So the balance equilibrium manifold, we have the formulation to calculate that given the dynamics. And once you calculate that, it turned out to be the controller design can be followed in two steps. First step, you figure out what is the steering and the speed control I should follow certain trajectory. If you give me X, Y position or trajectory, I'm going to design controller speed and uh, the steering to follow that trajectory. Now, with that information, I'm going to calculate what is the BEM, what is the row angle you should follow. Once I know the, B, the balance angle I'm going to follow, I'm going to go back to the previous design controller to revise it, sort of compromise it. Right. The compromisation here is, well, I cannot do a perfect tracking same balance. I'm going to sacrifice a little bit about my tracking performance, but I can maintain the balance to tracking stabilized to this BEM. That's the two-step design, which is I put in this picture here. And I don't want to go to the too much details, but you know, if the system dynamics behave pretty nice, if you're assuming a certain um, assumption here, you can show that. Uh, the trade-off here is I'm not going to perfectly tracking on both system, both the subsystem, but I can achieve the you know near tracking like I can come the error is going to converge uh, neighborhood of the the origin right or the zero the zero is going to converge so that's that's the basically idea. Now I'm going to show you um, uh, just some results we did. This is a couple of years ago. We have this uh, Thomas bike you know. Uh, in the parking lot on campus, we draw the line on the parking lot. This is a circular shape, or this is also a shape. You can see that under the GPS, you can do this kind of balancing control. There's another issue here. Left hand side is a circular shape, and the right hand side is um, it's um, it's an eight shape, which is um, you do have the slower speed under the GPS. You can do this uh, turning with uh, you know with a large uh, eight shape um, trajectory. That's not a, that's not a problem. We can do that. And uh, so basically, if you look at that, I don't have the time to show. If you look at the, what is the trajectory the H shape here, so this is just to show to you um, the two results. So one of these, uh, the bottom one, we compare with the human writing. And uh, this is the XY position trajectory. Middle one here is showing the row angle of the bike, right? Row angle of the bike. And here's uh, the error of the position. This is uh, the uh, row angle. Uh, this is the uh, 
uh, row angle on the right hand side here, the last column here is uh, the control inputs. So you control the speed, you control the steering angle. And the basic idea here is uh, with compare with the human riding. It turned out to be the autonomous riding similar to the human riding. So there's no, no surprise of this kind of uh, um, control inputs and the control performance. Fine, we designed the controller to do this kind of job. Now, let's turn into, well, we don't know this model. How we're getting, getting this, uh, this idea being, being carried out uh, in the data-driven model or learning-based. So the objective here is uh, we do want to design the learning-based controller. Um, we assume we don't know the, the, the model. And uh, we do want to guarantee the control performance rather than just uh, turning this controller as a sort of a black box type of controller. That's not our goal. And the approach we're addressing here, we're using the Gaussian process model, learning model. So basically, it's a, it's a parametric um, sort of a, a learning based uh, um, idea. And uh, the, the key part here, I guess, is well, like I said, you know, we're, we're mechanical engineers. We know the physical model. We know some property of physical model, even though we don't know the precise model. So the basic approach is we want to combine that knowledge of the structure property of the dynamics combined with the learning, right? So we're not competing with computer scientists. They just blindly turning the model, just getting the data. So we want to merge, sort of integrate the physical information of the dynamic system and uh, design this uh, learning-based control by this kind of knowledge, right? Integrate with that knowledge. So let's go back to the design idea. Um, I already told you, this is the picture I showed earlier, right? <coughs> so the earlier design we did is taking this uh, blue color here. So I'm designing a controller, follow this, uh, given this uh, design controller Z such that I first designed the controller Z to make the theta tracking theta D. Then I'm calculating the desired trajectory for alpha, which is unknown. So I'm calculating that, that's a BEM. Once I know the uh, alpha, I'm going to stabilize it. Then I'm going to modify the previous controller Z such that I'm going to achieve the simultaneously tracking and the balancing. All right, so that's what I did before. All right, so here's just a recap, right? Here's just a recap. What is a BEM if I knew perfectly F theta and F alpha. Here's the equation you're going to, you're going to solve to, to, to solve that problem. Now, let's assume we don't know F theta. We don't know F alpha. How you're going to just solve the problem as we just state here. I just basically is, I give you the theta D, you're tracking theta D, and you're going to estimate what is alpha D, which is not given, is the intrinsic. Right. It's a balancing angle, the BEM, which is we need to estimate it. Same time, uh, without knowing F theta and F alpha, how can I design a controller which is guaranteed the performance you know, as we, we, we like to have? Okay, so uh, the design, let me just, let me go back here. So design we're gonna go here is going to this red, red color font here. Let's just, uh, just uh, look at it. What is the basic idea of design here? Well, the basic idea design, we come up with the two type of the controller we design here. So let's just assume we know alpha D. Suppose we know alpha D. I'm going to design a controller. First of all, I'm going to control the alpha to follow alpha D. Alpha D is a desired uh, balancing internal state variable. I try to balance it. So I'm not going to design the tracking first. I'm going to design stabilization first. So we call that controller inverse dynamics control, right? Let's assume that. Now, the second part of that is, I'm going to suppose I, the, my, my goal here then following, how do I estimate alpha D, which is uh, probably is here. How do I estimate alpha D, and how do I design a controller to make sure theta is gonna follow theta D? We formulate that problem as the model predictive control problem here, MPC control. So if you look at this, uh, this uh, schematic here or pipeline here for our algorithm, so we do have the sort of two Gaussian process model. One is going to estimate F theta. Another one is going to estimate uh, F alpha inverse. Then I'm going to have the inverse dynamics based uh, control, which is solving the problem given alpha D. I'm going to stabilize alpha to alpha D. Then the second part of the control is designed by MPC controller, which is 
I'm going to figure out how do I do the tracking problem. Same time, I'm going to solve the how do we estimate alpha d. So that's, that's the basic approach here. So this is just more uh, technical uh, details. And uh, I mean, from here, you see that why do we require m greater or equal to n? That's a, that's a sort of a technical reason we, we, we require that. And uh, I think we're just uh, currently working towards uh, extending this idea, this world. All right, so, um, so here's just a recap, you know, control task. Here's what we're going to give them, and we're going to follow this. We're going to estimate alpha d, we're going to follow uh, theta d. And uh, design the inverse dynamics control, that's pretty standard. And um, we just designed a feedback uh, controller here. And uh, with this control, we can, we can uh, control the convergence rate, right? How fast the alpha is going to stabilize the alpha d. This is, a, this is a sort of one trick we're using here. Right? So think about what is the challenge for this problem. The challenge, one of the major challenges is, is the coupling dynamic between theta and alpha. So the approach we're doing here is if I can make the alpha converge into alpha d fast, which is we can control by this design variable epsilon. So if I make epsilon small enough, then I can make the alpha to convert to alpha d very quick, rapidly. This technique in control design called a signal perturbation. So if you learn the nonlinear control, this is one of the techniques invented in 80s and 90s for singular perturbation. The singular perturbation idea is well, your dynamics, one part is fast, one part is slow. Then I can decouple these two dynamics by assuming the fast dynamic converge first. Then approximately, I can take another converging values to plug in the other parts, so decouple these two subsystems. That's what we did here. So we make sure we can make the alpha converge really, really fast, exponentially fast, right? Then I'm going to estimate my theta to theta hat so that I decouple these two dynamics. That's the training part for this underactuated balance in robotic system. So we don't do the inverting, right? Because the inverting is non-casual. You need the future trajectory to, predict, to calculate what is the current control, which is not realistic. So then technically, you know, we apply this, we say we're gonna build the theta to estimate the theta. We build the theta hat to estimate the theta so we can guarantee that the theta hat is approaching to theta close enough because the singular perturbation. Then you formulate uh, this, uh, this MPC problem. You got this MPC trying to estimate the alpha d and also control the theta to follow theta d, right? Now, this formulation here is deterministic because assuming I know f theta and f alpha, now next step, we're trying to relax that uh, assumption. So everything here is deterministic because I knew the f theta, f alpha, then what I need to do here, I'm going to introduce this Gaussian process to estimate so that I do have this uh, sort of a probabilistic uh, formulation, the counterpart of the MPC I have. So um, then I'm just going to go through that. This is just uh, two slides to just uh, showing that the probabilistic type of the design. And finally, we can show that under this, uh, this uh, control estimation, so uh, we can show that um, this, uh, this property, you know, the error is going to converge to a bound, which is I can figure out this bound depends on your model accuracy, right? So, so we all know that uh, if you had a garbage in, the learning system is a problem, it's a garbage in, garbage out. If you cannot guarantee my estimation accuracy for the model, I cannot guarantee your performance. So we, we, we show that the error you're going to say is related to the how accurate of your model estimation. And uh, the challenge here is the details. Uh, this is just a summarize, you know, early this year we had the papers uh, in the transacting on robotics. And this is the paper we presented there. So if you are interested, uh, probably, you know, you can take a look at the paper. Now, I want to show you some results, right? I want to show you some the implementation results. First example, I want to show this, uh, you know, inverted pendulum. Um, so the inverted pendulum here, what we did here a couple of years ago, back to you know uh, five years ago, probably five, six years ago. So the good thing about learning control here, we don't need the system to be balanced to connect the data. You just uh, exactly the system that we did here. The left-hand side is a controller around learning base. The right-hand side is a physical model base. This is a tracking uh, composite uh, sine wave uh, trajectory for theta. So this is a swim arm theta. And then there's a square wave. So this is theta basically is going to swim back and forth, right? 
So the learning-based controller actually is a, achieved pretty good uh, performance. I think there's a, let me just uh, close this video. Let me show you some of the data here. So here's the data. This is the theta D and the theta tracking under two types of controller. Why the physical model-based controller? Why the learning-based controller? And uh, the middle here is the alpha, which is you need to estimate, right? If there, there's three trajectory here uh, related to the MPC estimation. Uh, the EIC controller is, uh, is a physical model base, and the learning controller is a blue color. And you can see this is the error for theta, this is the error for alpha, and here's the control inputs. And the last figure here is uh, the, in order for you to estimate alpha D, you have this fictitious input by the MPC controller. This is the, what is that controller input it should be. So from here, I guess uh, I want you to pay attention to this blue color here is an early based control error uh, for theta and for alpha here. So obviously this is a smaller for learning based control. And this one is hard to see. I guess I have uh, one more um, slide to show you this. Uh, here is a square wave, right? So this is the multiple rounds. The blue color is the error for the learning based control, the mean values and the standard deviation. And the blue one, uh, the, the black one is a physical learning model, physical model base. And this is a E theta, E alpha, the error for alpha. This is a, a square wave. This is a square wave, this is a sine wave. And here, this table just to show to you comparison between two different types of trajectory for theta to follow and the two types of different controller. And here is just a statistical uh, results showing what is the mean errors and uh, standard deviations for theta and for alpha. It turned out to be the learning based controller actually is, you know, actually uh, overperformed uh, compared with um, uh, the, the physical model based controller, right? So we also run this example for the bicycle system, right? So we have, I just show you one quick video. This is an indoor experiment. This is my former student, Ko Chang. Uh, he is now working in a, a startup, not a startup, it's a, yeah, it's a sort of a startup company, not autonomous driving in Boston area. And if he did these experiments, so, you know, just to show the bicycle indoor testing, I don't think uh, it's clear for this video, but um, similarly, I just want to show you the tracking trajectory for the street night tracking, for sign solo trajectory tracking, circular trajectory tracking. Um, the, the blue line is the learning base, and uh, the black line is um, the physical model base, and the red curve here, red curve here is the desired trajectory for position, and the, the, the bottom row here showing the row angle, right? So this is the row angle for learning based controller and for the physical model based controller under these three different trajectories. And um, let me show you the, the arrow. So the blue curve is the error for the learning based controller uh, under three different uh, trajectories. This is a straight line, uh, sine solo tracking trajectory, and a circular trajectory. And the bottom one showing the row angle error. So basically, uh, the, row, the learning based controller all demonstrate a smaller performance compared with, uh, with the physical models. Uh, this table just uh, summarized um, the ESC based controller, which is a physical model based controller, learning based controller in terms of position errors and the row angle errors. And again, it consistently demonstrates the learning based errors are definitely um, it's, um, smaller um, in terms of both of the mean of the error, but also the, the variance of the error. Now, this picture just demonstrates um, what is the error distribution compared with the training data sets. So if you had a 200 points of training data for the pendulum system, and what is the range of the contours of that error distribution? So no surprising, with the increase of the training data points, you're getting this error distribution is smaller. Now also we compare with the physical model-based controller, EIC controller, this is a purple curve here. And after certain data points, it's not necessarily more data is better, right? I mean, at the beginning, yes, it's a, you get more data training, you get a better uh, performance, but after certain values, I really, it's, a, it's, it's not the, you know, you have enough data and uh, adding more training data sometimes could be even, um, you know, uh, harmful to getting the accurate model, right? So on the right-hand side here, showing the, the weighting factors, uh, and I didn't mention this um, in much detail. So in our MPC controller design, we weight you know, in that objective function, we weigh the variance of the Gaussian process model. 
So the basic idea is how confident you would think your model estimation. So variance is quantified, uh, variance quantifies the, the confidence of the, the model accuracy. That's sort of like a second moment, right? So, so if you weighted that at a different um, weighting functions, you would have a different error distribution. So that's just tell you we could uh, twist in that log. You know, if you have high confidence of your learning model, then you should have uh, weighted uh, less of that uh, um, that uh, that variance uh, uh, vector uh, variant uh, variance there. Okay, so I think there is a problem about the time. I'm just uh, trying to uh, very quickly present one study and summarize. We did uh, build a learning based model. <coughs> However, we're not we're taking advantage. Right? We are, like I said, I repeat in saying, I'm a mechanical engineer, and uh, I do know this system has this structure property. Right? This uh, decompose, decompose the, the internal, external convertible dynamics. I take advantage of that. Even though I don't know the model precisely, but I do know their dynamics satisfy this ESA structure property. I'm taking advantage of that knowledge, integrate that knowledge into the machine learning techniques so that we can break down this black box and try to say, well, this is no longer a black box, right? And uh, I can get dived into that and say, if I use this knowledge or information properly enough, we can take advantage of the knowledge of the dynamic system. That's what has been demonstrated in this under balanced robotic system, right? So we demonstrate that through some of the experiments now, if you're going to say what are we going to do next to improve our performance, well, Gaussian process model is uh, it's the downside of using a Gaussian process model is it's, uh, it's really need a large data training. And also, computationally, it's very demanding. Plus, we had MPC, where everybody knows that MPC is uh, computationally also expensive. So the idea here is can we design some of this, uh, you know, Sort of a learning-based uh, device or or algorithm, we can build some hardware system to co-design with the software system to dedicate. Um, maybe um, right now we're implementing this with uh, with um, FPGA, you know, which is uh, already you know trying to get in a high speed. But uh, still, we want to move in towards more uh, computationally efficient design in that direction. And uh, otherwise, so we're, another question I didn't stop here, we didn't get um, really discussed in details, is how do we select the training data? Which is, uh, I think it's still an open question here, how do we do the you know, efficiently select the data to train the model? So, um, well, all my talk here, you know, it's uh, not just uh, my work, right? It's uh, primarily my students' work, so I really thanks for their support and also my colleagues and the funding agencies so um, I think there's some pictures. So this is a picture taken before pandemic with my students. And here's a robotic lab we have. If you get a chance to visit uh, New Jersey, you know, you're welcome to stop by at the Rutgers. And uh, last but not least, uh, we're hiring. So you know, one of the jobs here when I gave a seminar is, uh, well, if you, some of you or maybe you know some students looking for opportunities on the robotic system, you know, you're welcome to join us. And um, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for the uh, exciting uh, talk. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, any questions from the audience? Yeah, please. Yeah. How large is your horizon for your model prediction? Um, <laughs> uh, my students said it's uh, a few steps. I think either within five. Which the, the FPGA we're using is uh, National Instruments, uh, C-Real, uh, Canada taking that. So I think um, if I remember correctly, probably it's one or two steps. Very short. Is that a, uh, in terms of time, how long is that? Oh, this is implemented by 50 hertz to 100 hertz range. Oh, uh, 200? 100. 100. 100, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. I think the problem is 50 hertz. 50 hertz, okay. Yeah, control loop is running, the MPC is running 50 hertz. I see, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, any other? Yeah, please. You said the whiteboard used GPS for but we saw some videos of indoors as well. How do you guys position when you were indoors? So you, the GPS here, the accuracy is probably the centimeters, 10, 10 centimeter range. So I think the one of the problem here is if you notice that um, 
the actually the physical model is not that accurate, first of all. Secondly, uh, if you notice that I'm running a very large circuit, cir circuit, circular curve, right? Because the, one of the reasons is we're assuming this trajectory, so the xy position is given trajectory. So our problem is the if you notice that the xy position model is actually a kinematics model. So we're assuming you give me the trajectory is always feasible. We don't really do anything like uh, we do the planning of the trajectory. That's not a part of the question we considered here. So we're not considering the tire friction problems in the bicycle, whether they can turn fast enough. That is a part of the, out of the, the study here. So um, we didn't try. We tried the smallest trajectory uh, is um, probably six, five, Five diameters, five to five meter, four meters range, and uh, then once you shorten the, the the smaller trajectory, then you get an even bigger error. So the error probably one side is coming from localization, another side is because of the model accuracy. And um, interesting, I was um, I was speculating when we have these results, I was speculating whether the error distribution between the row and the position error has some correlation. Unfortunately, we didn't find anything. Uh, um, you know, large position error will reduce a large um, uh, row angle error. Um, we don't know yet how. We didn't really put a huge effort to improve the accuracy of that uh, tracking. Uh, uh, I mean, the student graduate, and even now, we didn't run those experiments. How, how are you estimating position in this one? Well, the position is given by GPS. The GPS has, uh, like I said, you know, ten to twenty centimeter accuracy. Uh, these are old version of the, the differential, the, the kinematic the correction, uh, uh, the, what is this, uh, uh, GPS units, uh, was 10 years ago. Yeah. Yes. About the robustness of the actuated part, have you uh, discussed how the, an external uh, disturbance can impact the the actuated part and how is the effect in the under actuated part and can we keep uh, controlling? The robustness issue here is not extensively compared, uh, uh, com uh, included in the design. So if you look at that, um, the the inverse dynamics is a model is sort of like a, you know, um, well, the the learning based part, the robustness here is take care, taken care of by this uh, Gaussian process model. You do have some variance here, is uh, you can twist it there. But in principle design, we really the everything the the control methodology we design here are not really included explicitly considered a robustness issue in the design. You know, MPC. If you say the MPC is, uh, we don't use any like a, you know stochastic MPC or or the what is other the tube based MPC or any any MPC itself is a model based controller. It doesn't have the robustness included, right? Unless you're going to explicitly consider the 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 tube of the you know that's a that's a typical um, uh, MPC design. We don't consider any of those in the design. Now, the robustness here, if I would comment on, is probably is the Gaussian process itself, the model itself has, can tolerate some the robustness, uh, you know, the variations of that. You can twist the variance of this learning model. Now, but that's not uh, by the design of the controller part. Okay, but it's by the, the properties of the Right, exactly, <clears throat> exactly. So so the, the controller design part of the methodology we're using are not explicitly incorporate the robustness issue here. So we're not using any robustness controller here. Uh, one, I have one question. Like, uh, uh, in terms of the controller, looks uh, very uh, uh, powerful. Uh, can it handle all kinds of like uh, under actuated system? Like, for example, the 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 bicycle is a uh, uh, non holonomic. Is that a generic uh, uh, applicable for both? Uh, yeah. So, so we did uh, actually yeah. the 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 non holonomic constraint in the bicycle oh. system actually was uh, considered in the kinematics model, right? Uh -huh. In this model here. You already have it. Yeah, yeah this kind of okay. this non holonomic is already incorporated there. Yeah. So to get in that model, when you take the third derivative, you think uh -huh. about the uh, low network velocity for these uh, contact points. Yes, mm -hmm. that being incorporated here. So it can handle both uh, hol holonomic and non holonomic. Yes. Kind of generic. Uh, it's, it's not. We're not restricted uh, yeah. to any any of those. Uh, generic. You can, any, you can incorporate any kind of like uh, under actuated system. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's the motivation for the uh, uh, back robot? What is the motivation? Yes. <laughs> well, it's a, it's an, we don't have we the primarily is just one platform we're using to quantify you know the human robot interaction. We we think that's a good example. We don't have really the, what is a real application of this. This is one of the tools that typically used for you know study the non holonomic system, study the the underactivity system, and then we take that example to study human robot interaction. So there is no sort of uh, um, big application of that. One time we were thinking about using this for agriculture robots. Actually, the, the robot we designed for that uh, turf grass is actually coming from two bicycle systems. We connect them together, right? But uh, really, we don't really use this to say what is the real application of this. It's just like a more fundamentally, we're taking this as the platform to study the, the property we designed. This is more fundamental uh, study, not uh, really uh, use this for any real application. Yeah. <laughs> One more question, please. Uh, why we need to consider under actuator uh, control? Why we want to add another control? We use enough control. Well, right? yes, that's a that's a sort of a philosophical problem, right? If yeah. you say I can, if I can achieve using minimum number of the control, that's better. Right? I mean, people are talking about, well, yeah, you can add another actuator there. What? But the <coughs> idea is, if you can achieve, use a less controller. That's you, less we can use? Well, that's a good question here. So we didn't talk about here. Oh. As a study, we just uh, um, submit uh, today's then night for the, <laughs> the conference then night for the American <laughs> Control Conference. So we just have, uh, my student had the paper trying to, or, or we consider here, as I mentioned to you, is the M greater than N. Oh. M is a actuated, actuated number of degree or actuators, right? How many are actuated? N is unactuated. So the study I did here, this MPC controller, the assumption we made here is M is greater than N. Now, if you make sure, okay, when, what happens if M is less than N? Well, intuitively, we came up is uh, you do need uh, the system. It's not, so basically, that means if you have a less control the number of the unactuated systems still can control it. That's a question, right? The question we come up with is, uh, well, for a particular design controller here, but generally speaking, I don't have an answer for that. But in QGME, I would think, well, if the system satisfies certain property, it is possible you can achieve using even less control, like one control, you can control three degree, you know, three unactuated systems. We have demonstrated you have an example has a triple pendulum, a positive, mounted on the car. <clears throat> you only control the car the acceleration. You can balance this triple, uh, uh, tri triple uh, inverted pendulum. So that's just to demonstrate that you, if the system dynamic is thirty by certain property, you know we speculated that probably is sort of like a straight feedback form or some particular uh, nonlinear dynamics. You can do this job. But the problem is not for general case. I hope I, I give you some answer. We do have the paper we will try to submit <laughs> today, and um, which is the deadline today. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Maybe it's. Uh... No, we didn't consider anything of that. We didn't even consider waste of that correct. So we just say this waste is, uh, is not our consideration. We just uh, make it just like uh, we drop this paint on those things, and uh, we're considered that are uniformly uh, cracks. We don't consider the cost to, you know, if you different the ways of this, you need more time to fill in those cracks. None of these practical um, application uh, factors are being incorporated in that algorithm. No. Those algorithms just to say, if I detect them, I'm constantly field, I'm dropping those flows at a certain speed, I consider that field is correct. Or our focus is on the planning and the algorithm there to solve this problem. No, 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 not uh, anything uh, um, considered the details of these uh, uh, factors in the, in the, in this, uh, in the example we demonstrated. Maybe more grants to further study this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We. We. I mean, uh, Kai Yan. This is my former student. Uh, uh, this is one of the leftover uh, 
uh, project, and we're thinking about the writing a proposal, and we never get you know this is already three years. We're <laughs> yeah, never getting a proposal there. Already and later, finally, yeah. we got these papers yeah. uh, conditionally accepted at the TRO. Ah, and um, yeah, but you know it's just yeah. like uh, everybody's busy. We never getting yeah. anything. So well, there could be a potential application of this. This problem itself is interesting for them. I presented the cracks, but uh, uh. you know. Uh, the other examples could be like uh, if you had uh, agricultural applications, you want uh -huh. to do the coverage uh, of the farm uh -huh. uh, to do the uh, rescue and, and uh, detecting rescue uh, task. You can this algorithm could also be used for that kind of application because yeah. you cover the whole area. You do need the completed coverage, but at the same time you want taking some actions. Yeah, um, that's so a, that's a that's a very science. important fundamental problem. There, yeah. yeah, there's some yeah. algorithmatic <laughs> development here, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I never get any chance to sit down and, uh, yeah. you know, get more. Congratulations for the TRO paper. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> okay. it's, it's not common, right? It's, uh, yeah. some, it's, it's, yeah. No, we presented that uh, conference, that uh, results in 2019, ICOR. Ah, uh, yeah. Takes, this is, uh, what is it, four years Six Takes years, so, you know, yeah, it's standard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, cool, yeah. Okay, I think uh, let's turn our speaker again. Yeah, thank you uh, again. Yeah. All right, thank you. So I hope this problem is too technical. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, certain students they they, they kind of uh, have some understanding. Yeah, I, I think, hope uh, not. That, that that's good to uh, have uh, some uh, application, start from application to fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We're gonna we're gonna meet four, right? Yeah. Maybe we uh, we take picture with you together. Sure. If you show your screen. Oh. oh okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll see you. I'll see you. Let me just. Uh... Wow, we just This is all your group. Huh? Half. 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 Nice to see you again, Professor. I visited yes. you last summer, I think. All right. Thank you. When we check something of the motor. Yeah. Nice to see you again. I took your class. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I you. I also write write. Uh, Did that write a letter for you? Yeah, recommendation letter. For me. <laughs> so you have a letter for you. Okay. 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 okay that's All right. right. You're you mean, right? What is his name? Juan. 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 <laughs> the other. So you're now study here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Doing, doing, yeah. All right. I'm not so elegant today. Come here. Antonio yeah. Oh, I told you you guys join. Okay. What time is it? Order, order. <laughs> so you've been here how many years? Two years? Five years? No. Six months. Six months. Six months. Oh, four, four, four months. Four months, actually. Can I do a horizontal work? You want to do a horizontal yeah. one? Okay. Yeah. Getting closer? Yeah, I'm getting closer now. Yeah, do a that's horizontal good. One. Perfect. All right, okay. thank you. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. So how's the uh, last year? Good. <laughs> it's good. Still doing, still doing good. robotics. I've got a medical robot. Oh, I see. Not, I see. That's nice. Nice. nice to see you here. Yeah. Nice to see you here. Yeah. I just messaged all, all of your students. Yeah. Yeah. I just yeah. messaged. I met you here. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He works the uh, the Boston area now. Oh really? He yeah. graduated. Yeah. 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 He yeah. already graduated. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Time. Time flies. <laughs> of course. Of yeah. course. Yes. Yes. Two years ago, I was Yeah, come with to you. visit back. Uh, you know, come to Rutgers to visit uh, if you got a chance. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> I'm glad you are here. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't even recognize you. You know, because uh, I mean, I'm, I mean, by writing quite a lot of. I mean, I hope we give you good comments for yeah, your yeah, recommendation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I enrolled uh, John Hopkins and I graduated. Okay, we can. I see. I see. I remember that. I, I, I remember John. I didn't know you moved to here. I know you. I, I graduated from the master's, so I'm. Here. So now you're doing PhD here? Yes. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, because I remember your. I, uh, you know, I, I remember you. You got some. Uh, somewhere I still saw your news that you're grad, you are in uh, Hopkins. Uh, probably you posted somewhere? Or well, link, link in? Probably. Link I don't remember where yeah, I, I, I saw you before yeah. in the news. I don't. Yeah. yeah, I don't need anything here. So All I see. right, see you. Oh, I'll see you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. thank you. You're going to fly back to New Jersey? Yeah, okay. this afternoon. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you.
Oh, is that right? Where, where you are at the mass school? In uh, IBM, the Polytechnic Institute. So it's in Mexico City? Oh, yeah. so no. <laughs> wow. Okay. 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 Okay.